Hey, it's Matt Pinfield. It's Monday. Welcome to In a Lonely Place. Yes, we call it that because, you know, obviously we're all sequestered, self-quarantined. It's the name of a great Smithereen song with Suzanne Vega, great Humphrey Bogart movie, great New Order song. And I just thought it would be the best name, you know, because I want it to come from a very, very honest place, which is what we're doing. I mean, our whole thing is that we're raising money for Music Cares because the people in our community, the music community, so many people like their lives have been completely uprooted. I mean, don't get me wrong. Everybody's lives have been uprooted by the COVID-19. But to do this show for me and to work with Linda Perry and Carrie Brown and Chris Rivero and everybody that we are here was the greatest idea because I just wanted to hang out with my friends who I usually be hanging out with and spending time with them, talking about their music, their careers, and the records that really they cannot live without, the things that have changed their lives to find them, you know. It's been a, it was a, it was a crazy weekend. You know, I had a, one of my best friends, this guy, Robbie Schickner, he was an usher in my first wedding. And we used to go see everybody together, the Smiths, Graham Parker, Joe Jackson, Elvis Costello, the Psychedel Furs. I mean, you name it, you know, um, I found out, he reached out to me and said, Matt, I, I got the COVID, man, and I'm, I don't know how if I'm going to survive this. And that, like, was very, very, very devastating to me yesterday. I mean, I love this guy so much, you know, we, uh, he always got the same music I did. And uh, we were just, we were, we've always been close. So I'm praying for him, he's going to be all right. And it made me think, you know, because the first place that we saw the Smiths together was Philadelphia. In the Tower Theater. The next night, we saw Tears for Fear songs in the big chair. Um, Kurt Smith is going to be on this show in a couple of weeks from Tears for Fears. Because I've been talking to him, too. Um, you know, Mad World, obviously, is like, <laughs> it's an anthem for these times. You know, I thought about Philly music and the history of the fact that I grew up in New Jersey, in between Philly and New York, two of the most amazing cities, you know, in America. So I always loved the Philly music scene, even though... I was a little far from it. So love the Gamble and Huff stuff, you know, like OJs and Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes. Love the Soul Survivors, Express with Your Heart. A, a, a bunch of white guys who like met, most people, they thought they were a black band, but they met because they had, they, they had a car accident and ran into each other on the highway. And then they, they found the best guys in both bands and had that big hit, Express with Your Heart. Love Jim Croce. You know, it's funny, I just happened to be listening him last night because I was talking to our next guest and I thought about how much I loved Jim Croce's songwriting and storytelling ability and when I saw when I was eight years old I watched this special on PBS and it blew me away and so I was watching that last night and then my friend posts a picture today of, of six years ago we're back with Rob Zombie and you know people think you know that metal guys would be listening to metal Rob Zombie was listening to before he went on stage, Jim Croce, which is amazing. So I love Jim Croce, and I just wanted to make sure that I let everybody know that. The other thing I'm going to say is, as the years go on, so much great stuff in Philadelphia. The A's, you know, I mean, I could just mention, name so many bands. But, and of course, now you know of War on Drugs, Kurt Vile. But this artist I have on right now, not only a friend of mine, but somebody I just have loved his music, and I've known him since the very, very beginning of him starting his musical career, running into him on the street in Austin, Texas. And I'm talking about Josh Ostrander right now from Mondo Cosmo, which he basically is Mondo Cosmo. Josh, what's up, buddy? How are you, man? Brother, it is good to see you. I'm you know, doing all right. I'm sorry about your buddy, man. I'm, I, I'm feeling for you right now. That sucks. Yeah, man. Yeah, it's tough, you know? So I put on that Jim Croce live thing that I saw when I was a kid. You know, people... You know, it's a, I had a great conversation with uh, Quentin Tarantino. He uh, co-owns a fusion restaurant in the West Village. And I asked him, like, I go, you put, I got a name in the beginning of Django Unchained. And, Dude, Jim Croce is one of the fucking greatest ever. And he goes, I use my actual 45. He used the <laughs> vinyl 45 on ABC Records. That's so cool. So fucking cool. Wow. You know, so anyway, so yeah, man, I just, uh, yeah, we pull strength from our friends. We're just so grateful to be alive. And, uh, you know, it's always our friends in the music to get us through everything. So anyway, so, man, I want to concentrate on good things. That's uh, what Robbie would want or any of my friends. So, Josh, let's talk about, like, 
you starting in music because like our story's funny. Tell people the story about how you and well, I met the street. So I was, you know, obviously like growing up a a kid of the nineties, you know, I was I was a huge fan of you before I ever met you. I was, you know, you were this icon to me. And then I'm not sure what year it was, but I was going, we were at South by and it was our first year at South by Southwest. And we were so excited. And I'm walking down the street. I don't know if it was Sixth Street or what. And I see Matt Penfield wearing my band's T-shirt. And I was like, are you freaking kidding me? Like, what is this must be a mistake. I went right up to you. And that started a friendship that's been, man, like freaking 15 years now. I would assume at least, you know, maybe more than that. But I just love you, and honestly, you're you're such a a supporter of me and my music. And you know, you come out to the shows, and you, you wear the t-shirts, and you're always checking in on me to make sure I'm doing all right. And I love that Jersey aspect of you, where you know you you're, you're honest, and you're and I just I love you, and I would I would do anything for you, and it's just nice to see you, and um, I just love you. Man, I love you too, Josh. I got to tell you, you know, that's the amazing thing, you know, and you know, we've we've had this journey, you know, through LaGuardia because I was a fan of your first band. And then like, like, you know, like so many of my friends, we, I mean, we always, we ha- we've all had like, we got to go through trials and tribulations. And it's part of that growing thing where, you know, like where you're on a label, it's a job I might've had. And right. I learned a hard way and take hard knocks and we had to do different things. And then Eastern Conference Champions was your next band. And yeah. I fucking loved you guys. <laughs> it was wild because I was watching a rerun of something on just on the TV Friday Night Lights, and it was like your track. Oh yeah, that was a big one for us. Yeah, and I was like, awesome, man. There it is. <laughs> I remember buying the import. Remember, I told you the story. I've got it's in storage. I mean, when I don't oh, know, man, man. I'm gonna get back to New Jersey to go through. <laughs> that story. But there's there's this actual. They made the record label made the most interesting thing. It was fiction, right? Was it? No, no, we were with, oh man, was it Island? Island UK? Oh, it was Island. Island. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So the label you were on did this really fucking wild thing where they made a actual CD that was vinyl and the CD. It was this, I think it was one song or two songs. I'm not sure. But yeah, you could put it in your CD, CD player and play it. And then you could pull it out and put it on your, on, you know, your record player. And I was like, I and I thought it was the greatest idea. I never got one. And then you got one probably because I sent it to you. No, I bought it actually. At oh, you bought it. Rebel Rebel Records on Bleecker and Christopher in New York City. Oh, my I God. bought it. You know, <laughs> like, yeah. So well, cool. I'm going to give that to you when, when I one day find it. Because <laughs> I really, really, really want to get give that to you. But, you know, I love that, you, you, you know, you had the band. And then, you know, you went, you decided at one point, yeah, move and go solo. Tell me, like, tell me about. I want to know more, like, I mean, about like your love of music and you as a, as a kid and growing up around Philadelphia. Tell me about what your. I mean, obviously, you talked about when twenty. I know it was important to you and all the other things, but can you kind of tell me about what was the thing that absolutely drove you to know you wanted to play guitar and write songs? Man, I just um. I was probably late to music, like growing up in Philly, like I was like, I loved boys to men, you know what I mean? Like growing up as a kid, I was like, that was, I loved like, you know, soul music, R&B music. That was like where I, I, I first began to like music. And then, you know, I got into my teenager years. And then um, when Nirvana put out In Utero, that was the record for me. I'm, you know, my brother, my older brother, I was so blessed to have an older brother who had great musical taste. He was listening to like Jane's Addiction and, you know, just so much Stone Roses and stuff that was just over my head at the time. But I finally got into my own with, with In Utero and I was like, I want to play guitar. I want to figure out how to play these songs. And that was it, man. I, I, was, I was in the basement for two years. I didn't leave. I just, I was upset. Yeah. And I still am, but that, that was a fun time. And you just, it's so cool to think about like how, you know, like just you learned how to strum a guitar and you figured out the core. We didn't have a lot of money growing up. So I had to prove to my parents that I wasn't going to waste 
the money if they bought me a guitar. So I had to memorize the chord formations with the hand and show them that I knew what a G chord was and a D chord and an A chord. And that was, they were like, all right, we'll, we'll get you it for Christmas. And, um, man, I, I was just, I was gone. As soon as I started playing, I was like, this is what I'm going to do. I love it. Yeah, man, that's amazing. I love that. So, <laughs> so tell me, but you were, you were, how old were you when LaGuardia got signed and how did that transpire? Oh man. <sighs> you guys. Are just, you know. Well, I remember, I remember, um, I remember we had, we did a showcase on um, September, I think, September 8th. It was like a Friday or whatever that Friday was. We did a showcase for Interscope Records. And the following, what was it, Tuesday was 9-11. And we were like, oh, man, like, obviously, that's not going to happen. Um, and the whole world just stopped. Um, but it was soon after that. So it was 2011 when we signed with Republic. We signed with Republic right after that. Yeah. And we put out one record and got dropped. And then, which was funny because I would eventually re sign to Republic as yeah. Mondo Cosmo, which is whole. I talked about it's like running a wild life. It's crazy. So, but it is life. I mean, things come full circle. Yeah. It's funny. Well, now, Eastern Conference Champions, I always thought that was such a cool name. And very different because it had like a sports ah, reference to it. I, I loved it. It was the Brits, kinda... the Brits loved it. And I think they don't I think the Brits where you guys were people loved it. I wonder if they even knew what that meant. But yeah, it was a it was I mean we're you know we're from Philly, so like our sports are gospel, you know. So like if the Flyers make it to the playoffs, or if they win the playoffs, they're the Eastern Conference champions before they go to the Stanley Cup. And we just loved the name. Uh, we're frozen yeah. for a minute, folks. I'm just it's tough. Give like, it a second. There we go. Hey, Joe. Am I, am, am I back? There we go. Now, now I think you're back. Go so, ahead. You're sorry. Um, so, hey, but man. yeah, it, it was a cool band name, but I feel like it was tough Like when it came like to doing T-shirts and artwork because there were so many letters. It got a little tough. Yeah. You know, it's funny. It's a funny story. Speaking of Eastern Conference and the whole New York, Jersey, Philly rivalry over the years. <laughs> I remember I was doing a morning show in New York City and the Jersey Devils were like, dude, we're going to give you like five boxes to give away for these playoffs on your show because they were afraid. They didn't want the Philly fans to buy them all up. <laughs> and Philly still won, kicked our ass that year. I mean, I love the Devils. And look, you know, I was friends with Sean Avery from the, from the New York Rangers. He and I, like, he's got a tattoo of fish on one arm and oh, Rachel head on the other. And I That's fucked funny. up Sean and he's, he and I became great friends. But it's like really funny story. That's the whole deal. There's always been that rivalry with Philly and New York, obviously. Yeah, it's serious, man. Yeah. <laughs> it's an absolutely serious thing. Yeah. So, you know, so when that, when it came time to actually, you were like Eastern Conference champions, you were like, it was time to do something solo. What was the, what was the catalyst in that? Because I know we all go through changes, work with people in different things, and then we kind of decide sometimes that, you know, creatively, I have to make a change. I have to move. I have to shift and do things. And that's natural, you know, and, and it's, yeah. you know, one of my favorite documentaries is the Foo Fighters back and forth because, you know, there's sometimes, there's, you know, feelings get hurt and a lot of shit goes down, but that's fucking life because, you know, what are you going to do? You're going to stay in a situation if you don't feel it's the right thing? No, you can't. You right. got to have balls to stand up and say, you know, man, I'm going to, I got to do this right now for what I want to do and to express. Yeah. I mean, quitting ECC was easy. That was the hardest thing I've ever done. That was so hard because it was so much, it was such a family and it was like, but at the same time, Matt, I was working like three jobs, two jobs and doing the band and I was exhausted and I was like, and we couldn't get music out, you know? And it was like, we couldn't get tours. We couldn't afford to go on tour, you know? And I was just like, I can't do that. Like I had to leave the band to start getting music out because otherwise it was like, well, you know, maybe we should try to get signed before it out. We had to, you know, it was just, it got to be to the point where it was just like, I didn't feel I was, I was as an artist, I didn't feel, you know, fulfilled, you know, and it sucked to leave, but you know, I, I'm glad I did. I, it was, 
it was hard and it was, I lost a lot of friends, a lot of great friends. And, you know, I'm still working on fixing those relationships, you know, but so hard you to. Know, yeah, I mean, but sometimes, you know, like you got to you have to do what you got to do sometimes, you know, and it sucks. But, you know, that's it. But, you know, what, what, what came out of that is, you know, one of my fucking favorite albums oh. of the last you know five years and a song that fucking just blew me out of the water. <laughs> Absolutely. Just when I heard Shine, I was like, this is fucking Bob Dylan meets Richard Ashcroft meets fucking, I just like, I lost, I flipped when I heard the song. Oh, that's it's so cool. still one of my favorite songs. Uh -huh. So my like maybe top 100 songs ever. Wow. I, I gotta just say, there was so much beauty in the fucking execution. And it was also so much honesty and sadness and yeah. fighting through. And, you know, like, there was just, there was that thing, man, like right before the final chorus that just fucking, where you're, where you like just. My voice broke, yeah. Down, like, and I just went, fucking, this is, a, it was just, <laughs> there's a reason it went to number one, like, you know, adult alternative. It was yeah. just fucking such an, I love the song to this day. That's you know, amazing. Thank you. That means a lot. It's 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 so epic in in so many ways, and you know, like we get. I mean, I want to ask you about when you were writing that. Where where were you? Where were you at? Where was your? Oh place? man, I was I'm not in a good place. It was bad. I was. I assumed I was again writing and recording a song that nobody would ever hear, other than my friends. You know, and I was lost. I was working this job and. I was like, I'm not going to be able to do music anymore. And that broke my heart, you know? So like, you know, I was, it was, it was a prayer as much as it was a Hail Mary. It was just, I mean, it was, I, but Matt, when I cut it, I remember I recorded that vocal in that, in the breakdown uh, verse right before the last chorus. And it was the only take I did of it. And my voice broke because I remember feeling the power of that moment. So when you say that, that means a lot because I kept it in there. And um, man, I just I, to, to hear you say that and the messages that I get from people about that song. I mean, geez, I mean, something bigger was at work with that one. You know, like that was I don't I listen to it. I'm like, I don't even know how I did this. I don't know so spiritual man and it's a such a fucking beautiful way you know yeah. and, and i love that so much and i um you know it's still like the minute i hear the opening chords and if, there's different versions of it there's the full-on mm -hmm. there's acoustic versions it's there's a few stripped down ones you did for different music like streaming outlets and every single one of them just still fucking affects me <laughs> and, and it just hasn't lost its power man that's brilliant you know, i remember i was flying I was living in San Francisco doing K-Fog and uh, you were coming to do the Levi's Lounge to perform on a Sunday. Um, and I flew back just to be there. Like I'd gone to see my daughter Maya down in Florida in Jacksonville. And I, but I, but I knew I, you know, I, I, had, to, I, I had to come back and you had walked in and, you and I remember like, holy shit. Like we remember just some great stories and we hung out, man. I remember you and I sitting there cause that was a, such an incredible room, you know, like yeah. that it is, it was a small stage, but it was just so great. Yeah. Very, very, it was a moment of you and I reconnecting. And it was, it, it meant something to me because, you know, you'd know me through all these years, all these different versions of what I was doing. And, and when it started to like kind of take off a little bit, I could tell you, you felt a bit of pride, you know, like an older brother or something, you know? So like that was just, it meant a lot to me because, you know, in this business, you don't know, you know, you don't know a lot of people for that length of time. You know, it's it's special when it happens. Yeah. And, you know, and I got to tell you, Josh, it was, uh, you know, I, and I would come see you do it. I came to see you many times live. And I remember we were at the, um, the Greek in, in Berkeley. Oh, that was a good one. And you were there. Oh, you did the tour with Bastille. Mm -hmm. And it was just fucking what a night that was. <laughs> How beautiful that was. That was and, um, you know, like, right? I mean, it was just incredible. Yeah. And most recently, which was amazing, is you reached out to me. I knew you were playing. And that night, I wasn't really feeling that great. But I said, fuck it. I'm going to fucking see, see Josh. I'm going to see Mondo Cosmo. You got in a cab. You went on like 1030. And <laughs> you fucking were amazing. Oh, uh, 
It was, was it the hi-hat? The hi-hat. Yeah, at the hi-hat. Yeah, in Highland Park. Yeah. yeah, Highland Park. And I fucking, the funniest thing was, I was buying a t-shirt. Because, see, I always do work. <laughs> Always buy a T-shirt. It's but nice. I saw you from stage, and I yelled at you because yeah. I didn't want you to spend your money on it because I just give you one. But you, oh, you're always buying. Yeah. You know me. I always do that. I always support the band. I support the artist I love. That's and any band. I mean, if I'm on a show, it's like the least I can do is to buy a, buy a T-shirt. Whoa, whoa, the camera. I was going crazy. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, um, so, you, so, yeah, Josh, like, let's talk about some of the other the songs, uh, you know, over the last few years that I love. I want to talk about the fact that Plastic Soul, when you named the first solo record Plastic Soul, you know, the first person who ever brought that that term up is, you know, obviously somebody that I got to be very, got to be friends with, who was an idol as a kid, David Bowie. Um, yeah. So is that where you got the title or was it from somewhere else? I didn't no, know. I got it from, it was the weekend that Bowie passed away. And um, we, I, I, my, my wife was cleaning the house. She was vacuuming and she had a playlist on and we were kind of bummed out about the Bowie situation, obviously. And um, there was a song playing in the background um, and it was uh, Irma Franklin's piece of your heart, which is oh, God, song yeah. that chance. Yeah, it's just one of the greatest. Yeah. But I never heard the original version and this was the first time I heard it. And um it had that this beautiful piano intro on it. And I was like, ah, I'm gonna sample that and write a song to it. I'm gonna and it'll be about David Bowie. And I just did it. I it I wrote the lyrics out in like half an hour, recorded the song that day, and it was done. And I love the idea of the lyrics of like time travel and and we were talking about like how cool it would be if we didn't know it, but in fact we were falling in love with each other. In we might have froze for a second, but I'm sure I'm after a little time. Back. Josh will be right back, guys. All right, go ahead, Josh. You're back. We're good. Am I back? Yeah, you're Sorry, back. Man. I want to let everybody know, like, you know, just so they don't worry. But, um, so uh, I love the idea of the lyrics being about time travel and falling in love with the same person in each lifetime that, you know, it was just an idea and it just became my favorite song on the record. And when they asked me what I wanted to call it, I was like, let's call it Plastic Soul. It's perfect. Yeah, it's such a great song, man. And, you know, Aria, your wife, is so fucking cool. She's amazing. Oh, she's the best. You know, I love her. You guys are like my full-on friends, man. I, and I love that. And it's really funny because I met her separate from you when she was with her best friend. Alex, yeah. Alex, we were all staying at a hotel in New York City. And they're like... She goes up and goes, Matt, I'm 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 Josh's. Like, What's up? So we're like, hey, I just, I remember it. It was like a quick two day trip. Yeah, New York for January Jane. I was going to see those guys play this showcase, and then I went back, and it was like I just remember uh, it was very very cool. But she I want to you know, love you. I just she, yeah, she's the best. But no, I just want to say you know like the thing is, so that record I you know I I recently like I said I was joking with you. Me and Rick Krim were like record shopping. I'm like, dude. I just found your fucking double yeah. vinyl. And you're like, I would have given you one. I'm like, no, 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 let me buy it. Let me buy it. I mean, I would, <laughs> look, if it's a, if it's the one thing I can do for artists, it's spend the money. I don't need the freebies. You know what I mean? I'd rather spend the money. And, uh, but what a, what a great record. So when it came time to do the second record, we hung out, we had like a release party hang. Yeah. Um, And you ended up working on some stuff with, one of the guys from Black Rebel Motorcycle Club, which is a band that we both love, obviously. Yeah. Talk to me about that. So um, when it came time to write my next record, I had a freak out and I messed up my hand. I had one of those terrible moments that I'll forever regret where it was a video shoot that went bad and I, I freaked out and I punched the glass door by accident. I, I really messed my hand up and it was terrible. That led me to not being able to play guitar, but I was, I was, you know, forced, I had to write the next record. So I got a phone call from this guy named Peter Hayes from a band called Black Rebel Motorcycle Club. Uh, we had a mutual friend. I, I had opened up for Black Rebel for years, but we, I was never really close with them. And PD was like, I hear you need some help. And man, dude, just save the day. He came in, he helped me like, 
you know, pick which song should be worked on. He helped me play guitar when I couldn't do anything, you know, because I was playing, but I had a cast on. So anything intricate, Petey would play. And he'd sing on the songs. He would send me vocal ideas. And I'd be like, Pete, can I just keep this in? And he'd be like, yeah, I don't care, you know? Yeah. Legend. So fun. Yeah. And it was ended up being like literally just such a great record. And I love the way that you literally went through you know, all the things on that record. And I, and I listened to all the different songs, all the different styles you, you took. But I love the warmth of everybody that was involved in that record. We were all hanging out one night on the street. That was a great night, yeah. yeah fucking such a great night. It was amazing. <laughs> you know, and, and I just, you know, I'm so glad. Everybody watching, I'm sure if you, you got to go to wherever you stream music, however you consume it. And you got to listen to Mondo Cosmo. The fact that you... Literally, like the the name on the Cosmo comes from your dog and a John Waters film. And dude, yeah. Philly, John Waters, dude, I the best. I finally met him in San Francisco on the street. I stalked him. I hung with him. I'm like, dude, I bought Shock Value uh. when I was a teenager. <laughs> and like, you know, there's funny stories that like even Steve Lukather from Toto, his first date with his wife, he's like, I'm going to fucking see how far I like. <laughs> if she could feel my incent, he took her to see Pink Flamingos. <laughs> Which is oh, like just, wow. yeah, just Let's find it's out. Yeah. Well, we're going to go through your albums right now, the seven albums that you love um, that are really important to you in your life. Yeah. We were just talking about Black Rebel Motorcycle Club. Now, I love so many of the albums. Um, you know, obviously the first one, well, whatever, whatever happened to my rock and roll. And then, you know, um, Howl with Fucking Ain't No Easy Way and Shuffle Your Feet. But I also love Baby 81, which I love the title because it's it's a baby aspirin. <laughs> so tell me, you picked that record. We, we, we love things like Weapon of Choice, all these great songs that these guys have done. Tell me why you love this record. I, I don't know the full story behind that record, I but I think that was the record that they made after they opened up for U2. And there was a little bit of a switch in their... I don't know what happened on that record, but there's a couple of songs where I'm just like, I am so blown away by how they pulled it off. And it's just, man, the opening track just freaking cooks and the whole record just front to back is just so good. But man, it's tough because how is one of my favorite records and their first record is just a classic, you know? So, but that's the one at baby 81 is the one I listen to the most probably. Yeah. I mean, you know, those songs are just, they're just a cool, they're just a cool, great band. Yeah. First time I met those dudes, it was like, there was, there was a bar, like before I lived out here the second time, I was, uh, you know, out here doing, I was doing our Columbia Records and I met them all at Dragonfly was this bar. Yeah. You know, hanging out that night. And then I went back and heard whatever happened to my rock and roll. And I was like, oh, these guys? this is the shit. All right. So Jersey, obviously I have a lot of, a lot of friends there, a lot of history and a lot of pride. And in this guy who, because he went out of his way, which I've told this story before to Bruce Springsteen, it was a, it was like, I thought these, the guys in the MTV music department were joking with me and <laughs> fucking with me. And we're, we're going to this page and plan show. And they're like, hey, you're Pete Phil, you know? I'm like, what are you fucking guys on about? And they're like, <laughs> Bruce called the bosses. Tell them to look out for you. I'm like, oh, <laughs> yeah. and like, and then of course, Found out it was absolutely true. Wow. He called the boss. Said, "Look out for Pinfield. He's not from the corporate world. He's a fucking down to earth guy. Make sure you look out for him." And he did it twice. Oh, shit, it was unbelievable. Thanked him years later when the Rising came out. Uh, this record for me is also one of my favorite fucking Bruce records. Although there's many, but you picked "Greetings from Asbury Park, New Jersey," which used to be my own stomping grounds. I ran that radio station there and. Well, I worked before I ran it. I worked there for years, you know, paying my dues. But loved that station, uh, you know, WHTG. You know, Bruce used to listen all the time. Uh, really? Yeah, he did. You know, uh, and That's we had a conversation cool. at, at a Soul Asylum show at Trax. Oh wow! But I will tell you. Yeah. So tell me why you love Greedy's from Masbury Park because it's fucking brilliant. What a debut album! I mean, I, it's only eight songs, I think. Right? It's um, actually, I think <laughs> nine. Is it nine? Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just, that freaking record is, I mean, he's, he's my, you know, Philly was very much same as Jersey when it came to Springsteen. Like he's, 
he's gospel to us, you know? So that dude, just the way he can write and his lyrics and the way he brings the listener in and just seeing like that record, that first, I mean, geez, man, he's just, there's something so special about the guy. I listen to him all the time. Yeah, I'm yeah. a freak about him. Yeah, I have to be. I have to be careful because I'm like, maybe I shouldn't listen too much because I'll try to pull from it. You know, and it's like you got to be careful with that. But man, he's inspiring. He really is. Oh, he's a fucking he's one of the greatest. He's the greatest. What a what a trooper and underdog. Like those stories about you know him and his girlfriend like at a, sh- a shitty hotel in Times Square and. You know, back then there were people in Columbia who were like, well, we got we got Billy Joel or we got you know this guy, and, you know, they were ready to drop. You think about dropping him, which is fucking unbelievable when you think about it. Yeah. They were born run, you know, and but and of course the rest is fucking history because he's so absolutely genius. Yeah. And records mean everything. You know, it's a wild dude. Can you believe that there's actually have you ever seen the uh, the the bill? <laughs> For the night that he played Max's Kansas City, no. you know, his, you know, his opening act was. Are you ready? So this Ooh. is Max's, like Bob Marley and the Whalers. You can't. You Bruce and the E Street Band and Bob Marley and the Whalers are opening up for you in a fucking club. Can you believe? It? How long did it take him to take their gear down? Oh my god, that was it taking the forever. That's funny. Only imagine how crazy that is. That's you know? funny. Wow. It's a it's a pretty amazing story when you think about it all the way around. That's great. Um, you know, Max's man. It's like uh, that was this. You know, obviously uh, Aerosmith got signed there, and yeah, you know, it was a big deal, and everybody used to hang out there, and you know, like uh, people were vying for the girls' attention. So it was like Todd Rundgren and Bowie, you know, fighting over. You know, like it's all kinds of crazy shit. It's pretty pretty nuts. That's but incredible. I love that record. That first record, growing up, fucking for you. You know, I mean those. Uh, you might have froze for a second, but I'm still here. You know that uh, they're waiting for you at Bellevue, Bellevue with your oxygen mask. Uh-huh. I live a block from Bellevue. Oh, uh, did you? So every time I walk by there, I think, well, they're waiting for you at Bellevue with your oxygen <laughs> mask. And I'm like, I, I can't stop, like, think about the hospital and not think about the, For You by Springsteen, which is so, so yeah. great. And you picked another record that I love. Pavement's Crooked Rain, Crooked Rain. Yeah. Big record for me on 120 Minutes. Big part of my uh, my life. I love Malkmus and all those guys. And I'll tell you a, fuck, a funny story quickly before we get into why you love the record, but you'll love this. During the Tibetan Freedom Concert, you know, the Beasties, by the way, the new Beasties uh, movie is now available here on Apple TV, which is so great. The Spike Jones one. And, you know, I did a lot of work with Beasties over the years. I was at the Tibetan Freedom Concert covering it for MTV. Um, and remember Danny Clinch, yeah. photographer who's done so much, going to me, I want to take a picture of you, man, put it on the artist wall. I'm like, well, I'm not an artist. He goes, no, you actually fucking are an artist. He goes, mm-hmm. you may not be a recording artist, but you are, he goes, you, you know what? He goes, you're, you're, your art is explaining to people why music is, is important. That's cool. That was really a compliment that meant a lot to me. But so on the way back from the concert, we're waiting for vans. So I'm in a van. With Stephen Maltmus, a pavement, <laughs> Sarah McLaughlin, oh my god, and Lee Scratch Perry. <laughs> <laughs> That's us, and we're fucking going back to New York City. Uh, you know, back to back to the island, and it's like you got this legendary reggae madman, me yeah. and Maltmus and Sarah, and I'm just like, what a fucking crazy group. What? That is funny. But, uh, <laughs> but we were all getting along, getting on extremely oh, yeah. well. That's so cool. You love crooked rain, crooked rain. Besides the fact that they cut your hair and gold sounds and those fucking great songs. Gold sounds. I listen to gold sounds like it's my job. I love range life too. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. Again, like I got into them uh, late, you know. But I, I am, I am a huge, huge fan of his. He's a, he's a brilliant dude. Yeah. So, I mean, did you see him live ever? Was it- yeah, I saw Pavement like in 90. Oh, no, it was too. I don't know. I was young. I was younger. And then I went and saw him play his. Um, he played a, a show at the Roxy, which was really interesting. Um, 
last year, I guess, at some point. I don't know. It was like his um his solo thing. You know, like with the Jicks or whatever he's doing, he's uh Yeah. Fucking great songwriter, man. And he's, he's just, just a yeah, he's just a good songwriter. His voice is just whatever he does is genius. Yeah. Yeah, you know, for me it was like I always I remember discovering them, you know, with trigger cut and uh oh. summer bay, you know, going back to Slinton and Enchanted and going. You so, know, like I was one of, I was one of the, really one of the only alternative commercial stations in America that was playing pavement. Summer Babe and all that shit, you know. Oh yeah, that's pretty out there, man. I mean, that's that's yeah. amazing. I found time and a place to play it, you know. Like I was, but I just I just thought they were important, so wanted to expose. That's so cool. Music, and that was the deal. Why we played Sliver by Nirvana, you know, it was us and and like stations in Seattle. That was about it, you know. At that period of time, you know. But glad that we did. But you know, Pavement, you know, they were such an important band, and I think. You know, uh, coming out of Fullerton, California, where they were from, you know, it was just very interesting. And, you know, I got to know them. Finally, like I was actually playing them on the radio for a while. But at uh, the Reading Festival in England, I just hung with them. I remember one time those guys guided by voices. Oh, uh, you know, all those dudes back back in the day, you know, and uh, you know, we're all out there like just like just, yeah, you know, getting fucked. Get a little fucked up, getting <laughs> drinking, you know, whatever. Back at Reading, but I'll never forget that stuff. And I just, uh, you know, those were, you know, those were really important to me. The yeah. next record you pick is Radiohead's OK Computer. Yeah, yeah, which is just obviously one of the great things. And I, and I mention this all the time. You see my some of my plaques behind me. So cool. Oh, that's me puppets, me puppets and Ransom. My friend switched them out. Because we had Jane's addiction up there and Allison Chains too. We just he was moving around. But they're all like in the fucking storage unit. I gotta go get this stuff out of New Jersey. And I have my OK computer in the bends and um such a big part of, of why I love those bands. But OK computer changed so many people's lives and changed the way that people saw music. Tell me yeah. why why you love that record. I love that record because I remember hearing Karma Police on the radio and I didn't totally get it. And then I went and bought the record and I listened to that record. I didn't get, I didn't get it. I didn't get it. I kept listening to it and it grew. I I just, after a while it grew on me and, and then it just became an obsession and a love for that record. I just think it's so great. And the production on it is just amazing. And I, I mean, that is just a, that's a record where a band is just, like doing whatever they want to do. And it's just gorgeous, you know? And um, man, I, I, yeah, I, I probably listen to kid a more these days, but that record, when it came out, just changed my life. It was excellent. You know, it's um, such a great, I mean, those are such great records and it's funny because, you know, when I was doing the interview with them for 120 minutes with me and Tom backstage at radio city music hall, nuts on tour, their documentary maker was like, hey, man, Matt, you mind if we uh, put this camera on the wall behind and just film what you guys are doing? I'm like, oh, it was for that documentary. Holy shit. Wow. Yeah, for meeting yeah. people it's easy, where the only time he actually smiles and is having fun and laughing <laughs> is with me. And it's a comic relief that, like, when I met Chris Martin, he ran it, he went came into K Rock in New York. He's like, holy shit. You're the fucking Mac guy, the only guy I would have liked in that documentary. <laughs> we had a history, we had a history, you know. But um, but yeah, it was just fucking. I I saw that that history happening. Yeah, such a fucking vindication for me. Yeah, I love the Bends too, and there were a lot of people ready to write them off, which really pissed me off. Yeah, and, was, uh, Bends yeah. is a fucking great record. That doesn't get talked about. Absolute, yeah. brilliant, brilliant record. I love that my, uh, you know. One of my exes is going, hello. I'm like, hey, look at my socials. I'm fucking doing this shit. Hello. Buddy. Hey, man, I'm real here. I'm so <laughs> fucking real. That's what you get. Because I love what I'm doing. I love the music. But I'm like, she's like, hello. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> you might want to just go online and take a look. <laughs> All right. Thanks, there you go. Anyway, so um, we'll go. Th- we're going to continue to go through the record. That is seriously funny. 
Um, I all right, so yeah, let's do this, dude. It's fucking hilarious. I just you gotta laugh at everything, and you especially gotta laugh at yourself. That's true. You really gotta you gotta realize sometimes how absolutely silly we are. Yeah, you know, we're human beings. You gotta be you know there's gotta be self deprecating because man, we're always a work in progress, dude. You know it's I would that, say progress, that's true. Not perfection, you know. Yeah, now you pick another band that I love from England called Spiritualized. Oh man, this uh, record. Jesus. Yeah, and you know, we got to talk about I'll talk about it. It's funny. I was listening to another song of theirs the other day on a mix I made called She Kissed Me, It Felt Like a Hit. And <laughs> it was like, you know, it was obviously it's a really, really cool tune. But this album is obviously a masterpiece. You picked Ladies and Gentlemen, We're Floating in Space. Tell me why you love that spiritualized record. Uh, front to back, just like listening to that album in sequence is just one of the most great beautiful things you can do that opening track might be my favorite opening track to any record ever made i just think it i get goosebumps thinking about it man like when I remember, it is and then i think come together is the second track and it just cooks man and sonically i don't know who recorded it or what but man it is the all the orchestration and his vocal is just uh, you know, it's amazing. It's really, really special record. You know, so it, it is so great, man. I love them, love him. And, you know, there's an interesting thing that there's, I think there's some kind of, now I could be wrong, but there's a connection with the Verve, maybe, with his ex who was in there, with Richard Ash, but that could be wrong. Uh, but I do know that you and I both also love the Verve very, very much. So there's yeah. like a the production. Hey, you know what? There's a great story about that you, you and I have about when you were recording the first solo record, and you were doing some stuff with Owen Morris. Oh, right? yeah. Oh. Well, you did beginning of, you know, Oasis, Morning Glory, all the, all the records that, you know, worked with Oasis. Fucking, and I remember tell this story because it's the greatest thing in the world because somebody tried to pull him off your record, a band we both love, but he was like, no, nah, no. Nah. So can you tell that story? Do you mind telling her you want me to do it? I mean, I think you should. Is that all right? I don't. I didn't know he was. Oh, 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 yes, yes, yes. So I'm, I'm, I'm in with Owen Morris, who, like he said, he did some, um, some of the most timeless Oasis records that'll live on for so long. Yeah. And he is, he is himself a character. He is a very amazing human being who very much gets in to the record with the band, and he just becomes part of the band, and he. And you love him so much. And we were going in to record our record with him. And I got an email one day from, it said, Noel Gallagher. And I was like, whoa. Like, why is Noel Gallagher emailing some kid from Philly? And this can't be right. And it's all it said, it said, are you sure you picked the right producer? Question mark. Noel. And I, I, I showed the band, I showed my manager. I was like, this can't be Noel Gallagher. And I was so excited about it because everybody's like, it, I think it is that I went and I showed Owen the email thinking like, how amazing is this? Like you're like, it was such an idiot because <laughs> Owen saw it and it broke his heart, you know, because it was like, it was a real situation like that. It's something like, there was turmoil there and it obviously affected him. And I felt like such a dick because like, I didn't know you, you, you idolize these people and you don't realize that you can actually, actually really mess them up. And to this day, I still don't know if it was Noel, but I mean, the way Owen got, I got, this, I got to tell you, but that wasn't your fault, man. You know what? We're just, we're always in that. We're excited because we always want to believe that we're all like fucking fighting for the same cause, baby. We are. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Like that we love our friends and we love the music and we all just want everyone. And that's how I look at life. Yeah. You know, I was never a guy like in radio or TV that ever went like, I'm doing a morning show. I mean, I'm, I was friends with Jim Kerr and Elvis Duran in New York. And like, I want, I want everybody to win. You know what yeah. I mean? Like you know, Kevin Klein in San Francisco, different people. I just, we all just, we love what we do. We're grateful to work. And there was another story too, um, you know, but you I, don't, don't feel bad about that. You were just like, yeah. you know, you know I, and who knows if it was, but I do know this. I know another bigger band. I talked about pulling 
him off your record and he said something to you like it was really cool. You know, I, what <laughs> band you was it? You? Remember when you two were going to take, was that him or was that a different producer? No, that was a different, what was that? I don't know. What was the deal with you two? Like they were, you were working on a record and yeah. the producer looked at you and said, don't worry, man. He goes, I'll do the, I'll do those guys later. I'm fucking, I'm with you, Josh, right now. Who was that? That was um, the mixer, um, Spike Stent. Oh, Mark Spike Stent. That's right. He was working on, like, um, I was in there. We were mixing a song of mine. It might have been Shine, and we were mixing it. And somebody came in, and it, it was you 2 on the phone call. And I was like, oh, they're like, I'll go. This is way more important than... Yeah. Well, we love you too. You and I are like, you know, they're groundbreaking for our lives. It's you too. And and he's like, no, Josh, this you're in what we're doing right now is important to me. I'll I'll get back to them, you know. And I was just like, holy frick. You know, like that was really cool. That's a story I loved. I was well, I brought it up. Last act. Yeah. I it in a while, but I knew that was just a great story all the way around. He's a, now, he's you a pick, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's a great I mean, fellow. Josh, the next, you got two more albums left. And I'm very yeah. excited to talk about them. One of them is just like one of these albums that just one of the greatest double albums ever. It <laughs> was made under some, you know, different circumstances for this legendary band. Um, and, you know, they finished the record in L.A. They came back and finished Tumbling Dice there. Oh. Uh, but, you know, the first song on this record is still like for me, like mm. one of my Stone songs of all time. Rocks off on Exile on Main Street, the double album made in France on a tax tax exile. Yeah, fucking record. Talk to me about why you love this record. This record is the, like if I get in my truck and I gotta drive somewhere, I just put this record on. It just makes me happy like nothing I've ever listened to before. I mean. Sweet Torn and Frayed, Loving Cup, Sweet Virginia. I mean, just, I mean, the f- freaking, I don't know how they did it, you know? And like, then you read the backstories, and I read Keith's book during that time. And like, just this was like a great, great rock and roll band. Just, man, just making a classic record. And it's just so good. It's it, so good. It really is. And it was the number one album. But at the time, historically, I mean, it, the singles were like, you know, they were happy, which is one of the fucking great Keith tunes like we love, right? Yeah. And there was like, you know, all down the line and uh, and Tumbling Dice were the singles off the record. But at the time, it was weird because the critics were not that warm to the record. You know, they were um, kind of odd when you really think about the fact that the, it's considered one of their greatest achievements ever. Yeah. What, it's really interesting. When you look back in time at what critics have said, and there's some brilliant critics, because I don't want to like ever, you know, just sit there and trash critics or anything about that. But some have also, you know, have just taken shots of bands over the years for no fucking apparent reason. But that yeah. record is just such an interesting thing. We made under that duress with that leaking basement and the microphones hanging downstairs. And, you know, it's like the, it's like the opposite of, even though I love Led Zeppelin 4, of course, like, but it's still with the same idea of having the microphones and using different things. And the fact that people are so innovative in recording that yeah. uh, they will use the echo in, in a bathroom. Uh, yeah. It just, for me, it's, it's just an incredible double album. I love the record. Yeah. Yeah, Giant just, Fight, man, you know, like. Um, yeah, come yeah. on. What, uh, is that your favorite? What's your favorite Stones record? Um, you know, my favorite Stone record is my two favorite Stones albums are. I, no, my, actually, I know what my favorite. My favorite is Beggar's Banquet. Um, yeah. And the reason being, you know, it's like really funny because like the song that I know everybody loves, that's my the late, last thing that I bring up is Sympathy for the Devil. Because, I mean, right. it's cool. I love it. But that's not why I love that album. I right. Love the album because I love the fact that they've gotten to this point where, even though I loved all the psychedelic stuff, like those fucking records, like, like you know, and I, I love the you know, with Brian Jones, it was just in this period where it was about to go to Mick Taylor. You know, I loved songs like No Expectations, that ballad. I loved yeah, um, Stray Cat Blues and 
uh, you know, salt of the earth, which is like how I've been thinking about, I've been playing that song recently because it reminds me of all the people out there, the emergency workers, the delivery people, the people in the hospitals, the first responders, the cops, the firemen. Like yeah. that's the song I put on when I'm thinking about them recently. Salt of the earth from that's that cool. record. A jigsaw puzzle, which is fucking oh. genius. Dear Doctor and Parachute Woman, but my favorite song on the album, Street Fighting Man. That's oh, what it is. Yeah. yeah, that's like, and it was banned in like at radio stations around the US at the time because to do a song like Street Fighting Man. And there's something about the production on that record, you know, Jimmy Miller, that Primal Scream had him produce Moving On Up and that stuff, yeah. which sounds so much like, I mean, obviously, they literally made that sound like a stone song and it's, it's, it's an anthem I love so much. I love but it. I'm bringing that up. Yeah. Anyway, so that, that's why, I mean, so, but I mean, it's hard with the Stones. Like, it's hard with the Beatles. Like, it's hard with the Who. Uh, like, it's hard with Springsteen or any of these bands that, you know, that have one favorite. But, you know, sometimes we just have to pick. Mm, and, yeah. But like, you know, Exile used to be the one, if you look, like, on some of my old lists or in older books, it's Exile. And then I think it moves to Beggar's Banquet. But that's only because, you know, as I get older, we all have different <laughs> things. I'm an old motherfucker, but I'm good. But I'm still here. Still mm. kicking, still breathing. Yeah, you know? yeah. And, uh, which is really funny because we think about, man, I'm lucky to be alive. Um, yeah. Your last record that you choose today is from a band I love. You know, it's guys that were in, you know, we, we look back at Uncle Tupelo, you yeah. know, and the bands that came out of that. And Wilco, man, when I first debuted Box Full of Letters oh, wow. in uh, 20 minutes, I was like, dude, I fucking love this. Because, of course... You know, I love Uncle Tupelo, the long cut and all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I just, I'm looking at that. I'm thinking about it. Um, what do you think? What's, what's your, what, why, why is that album, Yankee Foxtrot Hotel, which is genius? Why is that your favorite? I, that was when we were touring um, through the country. That was when I was really, I mean, we were just touring all the time. We were, uh, hey, if it freezes up, guys, stay with us. It happens sometime, and he is still with us right now. And I'm talking, of course, about Josh from Mondo. My Cotter. back? Yeah, you're back, my brother. You're back right now. Absolutely. That was yeah. just the record we would listen to when we were on tour all the time. And it just, I mean, it, how they take a simple song and just turn it on its head changed me and how I record music. You know, like that, that record is incredible. It really is. It's a great record. And, yeah, you know, yeah. just the, what they went through, like with labels and all How the do you shit. Stop that I, I'm, I'm trying to break your heart. Like, oh my it's God. one of the great documentaries that, man, it's like, you know, you, but they were so triumphant through it. And Tweety is fucking such an incredible songwriter, man. I I'm mean, solo. Yeah. No, we're not together. You and me. Yeah, yeah and Chris. Krim, <laughs> it's a great picture of you and I in the mirror. Yeah, was, I love after that. I got hit by the car. Yeah, I'm lucky to be alive. And I, we, you know, there's a great picture of you and I in a mirror. Yeah, so I, what was that venue was that the Ace Hotel? What was it? No, no. was it? Oh, I don't remember. I don't remember. But Tweety was so great. He played acoustic. We were fucking loving. It was it, the Ace. It was the Ace. You're right. Yeah, and uh, that was a great night. You know what I mean? I just. I never get tired. You know what also I love? I always love that song, and it's not on that album, but I, I was also always loved the late greats because it was the way of saying, hey, man, these other people that have been doing shit for a while, they're still fucking amazing, and they've done some yeah. amazing music. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, there's a, you know, there's so many uh, songs by Wilco uh, that I love. But, man, I mean, you know, I've never, my friend Rick Krim and his son, they always go to those Wilco, like, big outdoor concert thing. Have you ever been to one of those? Yeah, no, I'm waiting to get invited to come play that thing so bad. I don't know. <laughs> I got to tell Karen to put in a word for me. I just want to go. But I figure the only way I can afford to get the ticket to go is if I'm playing. <laughs> yeah, and you should. You know what would be great? You should be on that bill. That would be a fun one. I just want to see the band play. I love them so much. Yeah. Just an incredible band. One of my favorite drummers, too. He's amazing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Those guys, they're incredible. You know, so. Yeah. And I love them. I always have, you know, I, it's true. Like, it's funny. I just, you know, I just had gotten a lot of stuff on vinyl. Of course, yeah. I can't even walk through these rooms with the vinyl on the floor. So I'm just <laughs> like, 
<laughs> yeah, I'm going to stop buying vinyl for a little bit. You know, I, yeah. I got enough to keep me going for a while. I just yeah. want to say, Josh, you know, I so much love having you today. I'm a, such a huge fan. I, uh, as I, I view you as a person and as a musician, as a songwriter, as a performer. That was funny. <laughs> the high hat, when you yelled out, you're like, Pinfield, buy a t-shirt over there. I'm like, you don't have to buy one. I'm like, dude, of course. I would always. But that show was fucking great. Thank and you. do you know that's the last live show that I went to before the pandemic? Oh, wow. Jeez. And it was like I said, you know what I love? I love when I push myself. Like, I was like, I don't feel that good, man, tonight. But fuck, yeah. I'm going to see Josh play. I don't give a shit. He's going on 1030. I'm going. I'm going. And, I went. <laughs> and, you know, it's the same thing it always is. No matter how you feel, the minute you're in a room with live music, you're yeah. left quiet. It brings it all back to you. And you're just like, I don't care how, how tired you are, yeah. what's going on in your life, turmoil, whatever yeah. that happens to be. Live music is the fucking remedy and music in general for everything. So in the meantime, we'll do this. Yeah. You know, keep on doing things. And I, I just want to say, Josh, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Brother, so, I, I love you. I love you. I'm so thankful for you. I really yeah. am. Well, Josh, man, let's let's uh, let's just we'll, we'll keep staying on the phone. Okay. Tell them stories. Some funny. <laughs> I, one of my friends today told me the funniest thing. I can't say it on this on here right now. <laughs> I laughed. I almost like I said, dude, you have to stop. I'm gonna have a heart attack. I was laughing so hard this morning. I'm like, because it's like the most. It just blew me out of the water. And I'm and like, it's those things that keep us going. Yeah. Friends and the people we love in the music. So listen, thanks so much, Josh, for doing this. You got it. Yeah. Josh, I surrender. And it's Mondo Cosmo. And you need to know if you have not listened to the Mondo Cosmo albums, I'm sure you have. Like, I mean, people that are watching me are not fucking morons. You know what I mean? They're or or they're also not super casual music people. And even if you are, that's fine too, because Whatever, whatever level of music you love things on, uh, and it, it's all it's all good. You know, use music for however it works for you. But man, Mondo Cosmo, please go to wherever you stream music and listen to Josh's music, and start with Shine, one of my favorite songs of the last five years. You have to hear it. And then, so anyway, Josh, thank you so much for doing this. Tomorrow we have Butch Walker. This week. Wednesday, it's Johnny Resnick from the Goo Goo Dolls. All right. Thursday, Ed Rowland from Collective Soul. Friday, Pete Wentz from Fall Out Boy. This is In a Lonely Place. My name is Matt Pinfield. Thank you to Linda Perry, Kerry Brown, Chris Rivero, everybody who works on this show, and especially today to Josh from Mondo Cosmo for just having a great hang with me as always. All right. Love you, brother. Love you. Love you too, my brother. Guys, keep the music in your heart. and. Uh, just keep supporting musicians wherever you go.